Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. Today I'll be talking about the constitutional future of the United Kingdom with Glendora Jones of the Institute for Welsh Affairs, who's a prominent commentator on um, institutional and constitutional questions for the future of the United Kingdom. Glendora, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you. There are a number of commentators, I think including yourself, particularly from outside England, who think that the United Kingdom is facing a crisis. Um, can you tell us a bit more about where you think this crisis is located? Where is the shoe pinching, as it were? Well, thank you, Brendan. Thank you. With Nicola Sturgeon having recently addressed the Scottish Parliament about her plans for a second independence referendum, and the Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales, established by the Welsh Government, currently considering options for fundamental reform of the UK's constitutional structures. The four nations of these isles are quite truly approaching a crossroads of sorts in their shared journey. The political realities across the isles should be acknowledged. The trend for divergence in policy stances between the four parliaments has compounded the disagreement centred on constitutional change with different parties holding power in each institution for over 10 years. The customary argument that parliamentary sovereignty should rest solely with Westminster now stands challenged. As the traditional understanding of UK state sovereignty adjusts, I feel, to the practicalities of an interconnected world made more apparent as EU withdrawal, there is an opportunity for those advocating greater autonomy for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to progressively present a more sophisticated platform of debate for self-government. Interestingly, Westminster's tacit acceptance of Scottish acceptance, independence, as a legitimate option further to the 2014 referendum, for example, suggests that sovereignty is ultimately determined by the populations of the nation separately, and not by the people of the UK collectively. The possible challenge to the Conservative and Labour parties is to become more formally representative of the nations within their organisational structures. The makeup of the Liberal Democrats is already federalised and the strength of the various nationalist movements is at a level uncommonly seen in other multinational states globally. However, Britishness as a concept is much older than the United Kingdom. And it is unrealistic to argue that the Scottish people say in a notional independent territory would start considering the English as fellow Europeans instead of fellow British. So there is now a strategic need to explore some form of broad constitutional compromise which embraces the concerns of all parties and moves away from a narrow winner-takes-all answer to the challenges ahead. But that doesn't seem to be the view of the present Conservative government. Um, in, in the early part of the, of the last decade, it's true that a Conservative government acted as you, as you described. It, it recognised, as it were, Scottish sovereignty in holding an independence referendum. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the view of the present government. Uh, how long do you think that's going to take to change, if it does? I think the mood, the weight of public opinion, also, um, as I've uh, mentioned, the... Uh, uh, Constitutional Commission ongoing in Wales and the uh, political situation in Northern Ireland with Sinn Féin's election victory in May 2022 will probably focus minds increasingly uh, when the uh, uh, when the new uh, leader of the Conservatives is, is is in place and possibly the willingness to talk uh, to uh, to the other devolved administrations will uh, will possibly be uh, be greater than at present. Good. Um, many people associated with the Federal Trust would say that the answer to the problems that you've um, evoked uh, is a, a federal United Kingdom, uh, federal England in particular, and a federal United Kingdom more generally. Um, why don't you favour, as I understand it, such a, an outcome? Well, all unitary states such as the United Kingdom face ongoing challenges in acknowledging the partial autonomy and diversity of their constituent nations, especially in sustaining a sense of belonging to the larger political entity. To protect the UK's unity post-Brexit, the Welsh Government has suggested federalism as a way forward, mirroring unionist views in Scotland. However, federalism, whilst admittedly delivering more powers to Wales, 
offers restricted opportunities for expanding Scottish autonomy beyond the status quo and does little to tackle the UK's future relationship with the EU in a way that is satisfactory to the Scottish government. Federalism would likely deliver reform of the Barnett formula as designed by the Welsh government, but would impact negatively on the Scottish bloc grant, strengthening the attraction of a second independence referendum. The UK constitutional debate, I feel, has moved on substantively in recent years. The fact that the four constituent nations took different tacks in their responses to the COVID challenges has reaffirmed the various borders extent. Views in Wales about the uh, quality and the nature of Cardiff's interactions with Westminster has changed a great deal, especially due to Brexit. And the mood in Scotland is, as we have seen, is moving towards a, a second referendum. Yet the SNP's present platform of pursuing an independent Scotland within the European Union is, is problematic in today's circumstances, as by definition, it restricts the nation's ability to facilitate a single market with its largest trading partner, England. So given that the traditional model of a federal UK is currently, in my view, a politically difficult proposal, shall we say, and that secessionist tendencies are increasingly prevalent, there is the need for some fresh constitutional thinking. And if we were offered a hypothetical opportunity to uh, constitute Britain from scratch once more, could we not recognize the sovereignty of the home nations and seek to work within a robust social, economic and security partnership directed by a limited but mature political legislature? Starting from scratch is something that hasn't very often happened recently in British constitutional discussion and, uh, uh, and history. Um, but, but you have a, an innovative idea, which is um, that of bringing together two, ele two elements of political discourse, um, confederalism and federalism. Uh, a confederal federalism is what you favour. Can you give us uh, an outline of what that would imply? Yeah, starting from scratch, of course, rarely happens, uh, if ever. And we're all on a journey, and uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a it's, it's a matter of figuratively speaking and uh, thinking that we can uh, think outside boxes, or at least reimagine uses of uh, various constitutional tools, such as sovereignty. Um, yes, devolution involves a sovereign Westminster, in effect, delegating a measure of sovereign authority to the devolved institutions. Confederal federalism turns this constitutional approach on its head, advocating four sovereign nations of radically different population sizes, delegating some sovereign authority to central bodies in agreed areas of common interest. It proposes a confederation of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland with aspects of federal type control built into key policy areas. In such an arrangement, a council of the Isles could be responsible for enacting power on specific matters involving defence, foreign policy, trade, currency, macroeconomics, with a committee of member nations convening regularly to discuss other relevant issues which may demand a degree of cooperation and harmonisation of laws. The head of the Confederation would continue to be Her Majesty and successors, holding frequent audiences with the nation's first ministers. The National Parliament of each member nation would sit as the sovereign, legislative and representative body of its people, having every power and right that is not delegated to the joint institutions by constitution or treaty. And these national legislatures would be mirrored, of course, by legal structures. Scotland possessed its own legal system before 1999, whilst the development of a genuinely devolved legislature in Wales has led for a very good case to be made for introducing a distinct legal Welsh jurisdiction. And the ultimate authority for any laws and rights assigned to the centre within this confederal federal model uh, would sit with the Supreme Court of the Isles. As for being politically achievable, well, our situation has been made more pronounced, as I've already mentioned, by Sinn Féin's May election in Northern Ireland, joining a Conservative UK government in London, a Labour Senate in Wales, and an SNP Parliament in Scotland. Some reimagining of the use of sovereignty to address the concerns of both unionists and nationalists is essential 
if we had to settle on a lasting new partnership of the home nations for the century ahead. The non-legislative um, functions, the central functions that you talked about, defense, um, macroeconomic policy, um, external relations, um, have a strong element of executive action um, contained in them. Can you give us some indications about what sort of executive um, would be um, uh, at the centre uh, of this confederal federation? Well, the uh, aspects uh, to assigned to the centre, uh, I'll just briefly summarise. To sustain our economic union, the model assumes a common currency, bank and market. The social union is maintained through the guarantee of individuals' rights, of movement, residence and employment across all members. In upholding our joint security, the forces of defence and the organisation of foreign policy are also held centrally. A council of the Isles, as I've uh, uh, indicated, would act with mechanisms in place to address the differing population sizes of the nations, specifically through the composition of seats. Members of the council would typically be elected for a four year period, convening annually for a fixed time, say 90 days, unless urgent business is demanded. The council would assume its own standing orders, confirming a presiding officer, an executive whose prime minister and ministers enact power on matters involving defence, foreign policy, internal trade, currency and macroeconomics. Each bill considered by the council would be circulated to the four national parliaments in advance of final reading with nations empowered to make objections or suggest amendments before voting. Uh, this will provide a useful counterweight to any aspirations of the centre to act unilaterally on issues such as defence or foreign affairs. And on passing the head of the confederation would confirm the bill as the act as an act of the Council of the Isles. It's worth probably noting that as a counterweight, an additional counterweight to any encroachment or misuse of powers um, in enacting these shared central functions. And since sovereignty does rest with each nation, the model does assume that the right of a secession is implicit, subject to appropriate referenda and other treaty bound checks and balances. Would you think that uh, it would be psychologically and politically uh, particularly difficult for England so much bigger, so much richer, so much more populous than, than the rest of the, of the present United Kingdom, um, to feel itself at home in, in, in such a, a confederal federation? Well, I think there are a number of factors influencing, um, uh, in, influencing that situation. Uh, there are the, you know, the ongoing uh, 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 debates in Scotland, Wales, which... Uh, are, are, are most certainly uh, looking to reform the United Kingdom um, in more radical ways in Scotland, probably more than current thinking in Wales. Uh, there is, I understand, a growing sense that uh, England does need its own parliament to address some of the disparities and inequities within, uh, within itself, uh, whether that's through some sort of federalization or devolution. Uh, that's something I think that's uh, still being explored. Uh, what is important, uh, bearing in mind that there are various political influences factoring in uh, to the developing situation, and I do see that it is something that's progressively uh, becoming uh, increasingly to the fore, is that uh, there's a need to have discussions around what, how would the future relationships across our four nations be best served? What kinds of models would allow us to uh, get the SNP, get the Labour Party, the Conservative parties and others together to agree that um, this would be a successful way of collaborating going forward in the decades ahead. So this is a, it's a broad conversation, but also I believe it's a conversation that would benefit England itself because those internal inequities would be part of the, uh, uh, addressing those internal inequities would be part of the solution. Uh, how would um, such a model as you envisage come, a, come about? Uh, who would decide? Who would make the proposals for it to come about? Um, what would be the adoption mechanism? Well, before I move on to that, may I just talk a bit more about the uh, economic and demographic disparity uh, mm. that we do still, I mean, we, you know, it's, it's still a big part of this 
debate. I mean, it, I think it is one of the main reasons that the uh, uh, support for increased autonomy across the nations is is coalescing, uh, particularly to ensure that uh, they are able to address their unique set of circumstances going forwards. As mentioned, in 1999, England was omitted from the devolution reforms, as it was not allocated a parliament of its own in common with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. England now comprises over 56 million people, more than five times the total number living in the UK nations combined. However, England's continued unity is not without question, as it uh, contains significant regional variations in terms of wealth, status, power and population. It is significantly orientated heavily towards the South, producing almost 22% of the UK's total output. London acts as a strong centripetal force, undermining the position of Northern England more broadly. It could be said that England suffers from the absence of a discrete parliament through which its internal uh, tensions may be addressed. The risk, I suppose, of reframing the United Kingdom according to a model of confederal federalism, as discussed, is not so much that an influential and powerful English Parliament might dominate Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish institutions, which would be better placed than presently to address the disparities I've already mentioned, but that it could destabilise the work of those joint aisle-wide bodies if the arrangements were not held in respect. Yes, overrepresentation of the smaller nations in the Council might act as a limited counterbalance to the challenges faced, but there is little escaping the fact that England, with approximately 85% of the population, could potentially cause significant tests to the success of common British functions. But we should still aim high when endeavouring to solve our common problems. And this is why uh, a model which embraces the, uh, uh, the, the positive aspects, shall we say, of reassigning sovereignty to the individual nations, whilst understanding through negotiation and agreement the continued need to work closely together on matters involving defence, internal trade, currency, foreign policy, etc. Uh, I feel that a way forward through uh, uh, the choppy waters is achievable. And the adoption mechanism, what are, what are you envisaging? A, a referendum in all the four nations or would it be a parliamentary decision? I think uh, you know, we you know, certainly need the support of the four parliaments. I mean, establishing such a written framework for these aisles would prove invaluable across the political spectrum, with some finding reassurances in attempting to articulate the more distinctive elements of the UK's practices in a codified constitution or treaty, and with others seeking to cement the sovereignty position of the four nations individually in relation to a common British structure, and in terms of adoption, yes, the new arrangements would ideally uh, be secure, secure, would secure the support of the four nations' populations through referenda. I mean, the details of which, of course, would need ironing out going forward. Um, as part of that, clearly, there would also be lots of work to do on drafting constitutions and, uh, 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 and, and treaties. Yeah. How long have we got um, before events uh, uh, override the attempt to, to bring about reform? Uh, can the United Kingdom be maintained uh, intact um, or are we too late? Um, are you yourself a unionist? Uh, uh, and if so, what do you mean by that phrase? Well, a union of Britain or a league of the British Isles in some form is paramount, is of paramount importance to our future. But it need not take the form of today's UK unitary state, which is challenged. After all, Britishness as a concept is much older uh, than the UK. British ideals, British values are partly forged by geographic, historic, and cultural influences which usefully bridge the demands of world independence and the desire for increased autonomy in the nations. The challenge is to capture these principles in a new constitutional framework which strengthens arrangements for self-government whilst working within an aisle-wide structure typified by pluralism, justice, equality and solidarity. 
Indeed, the safeguarding of individual liberty within the nations through reimagining the use of sovereignty could serve as a counterweight to the inevitable instinct of the center to aggregate power deep within its core, especially at the territories more geographically distant. The UK is becoming increasingly diverse culturally, ethnically, legally, and politically. A widely accepted approach to successfully embracing such variations is to revise the nature of governance. The fact that written constitutions, for instance, make the machinery of government more accessible and transparent is one of the most persuasive arguments for their application. With many now asserting a multicultural Scottish, Welsh, English, or English, Northern Irish character before claiming a form of dual nationality, which also embraces a British personality, it is legitimate to reconsider the nature of Westminster's parliamentary sovereignty, such that it more appropriately encompasses authority only over key wide functions. The pressing issue, from my view, relates to whether sovereignty, as currently understood, should be shared across the five territorially defined identities, including that of Britain, in a traditional federal arrangement, or instead assigned individually to the four nations, which in turn could delegate or pool parts of their sovereign authority to common central institutions of a fundamentally British character. Today, you know, we are confronted by significant constitutional challenges and tests, which require exploration of fresh solutions and governance models. As already mentioned, different political parties have held power in each of the four parliaments for well over 10 years, with Scotland now moving towards a second independence referendum soon, in October 2023, potentially. And the Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales actively considering options for fundamental changes to the United Kingdom. That as the world now knows to its cost, climate change, pandemics, conflict and their economic repercussions respect no national boundaries. So we should and we must therefore approach our constitutional deliberations in the spirit of consensus building and cooperation and with a firm eye on the needs and aspirations of those future generations which will call these isles their home. So a form of Union of Britain or a form of the League of the British Isles or a federation is of paramount importance to our future. Ndua, thank you very much for a very um, stimulating and innovative presentation. Um, I'm sure these are all topics which will return in due course, um, and those who live longest will know most. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brendan.